We are continuing this series called What's Under Your Bed. We're going to wrap it up next week. And really, this message is supposed to go with next week's message, so they're taken together. This week is called The Rise of the Antichrist. Next week's going to be called The Demise of the Antichrist, spoiler alert. But we're going to be talking about end times. We're going to be talking about who is the Antichrist. Can we recognize who the Antichrist is? Is he alive today? What happens and what does God say about it? And what is the church's role in it all? I think that you're going to find this fascinating. If you have a pulse, you're going to be interested in this topic. But I want to let the Word of God set the table for us. We're going to be bouncing around in a couple different places today, but the two main places we're going to hover over is 2 Thessalonians and then Revelation 13. So if you want to make your way there, if not, we have the, the, the scripture up on the screen for you. And if you want to take notes and you didn't bring anything to take notes in and you're too old to realize that you have notes on your cell phone, <laughs> find the youngest person next to you that can show that to you. Or the prayer card that's in the seats in front of you, you can just use that and there's a pen and there's plenty of spots for you to take notes. If not, I'm just going to judge you from the stage. First John 2.18, I want you to hear this scripture. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Now, this is John, John the beloved disciple. This is a different letter of his than his gospel. But, but I want us to look at this for a moment because in one verse, there's a lot. The first thing is this, is that he says in this last hour. But that was like 2,000 years ago. So when I read scripture, before I really knew all of this, I would hear Jesus tell them that this is the last of days. And then I would see in other letters of Paul and John and Peter, and they're talking about the we are now in the end times. And then I see the televangelist on TV, and he's saying, these are the last days, but that was like 30 years ago. And then now I'm on stage telling you these are the last days. And, and does that mean that those are conflicting statements? Does that mean one of us is wrong? Does that mean that we're like, you know, that we're just trying to figure it out and we keep saying that to scare you? And I think those are all good questions. Are we in the last days? The answer is yes. But Jesus was in the last days. George Washington was in the last days. And so were your great grandparents. Here's what I mean. If you look at the entirety of human history, you've got to remember that you and I, we just look at things year to year, season to season, chronologically. And, and, and I know that in our lifespan, it's like, man, it's been forever now. But, but to God, who is above time, the last of days was marked by when the Messiah showed up. So when the Messiah showed up, that started the beginning of the last days. So when Jesus showed up, now we are in the last days. And I think even in the last probably year or two, you can start to see that we are indeed approaching the last days. We're, we're experiencing the birthing pains right now. The other part of this scripture that, that blew my mind is he says right here, many antichrists have come. Many. So how is there more than one, and how am I going to recognize when it's the Antichrist, like the, the satanic Captain America that shows up and is just God's you know, enemy and the chosen one of Satan? How, how are we going to know any of these things? How do we recognize it if there's been many? I think that's also a good question. But don't worry. I studied so you don't have to, at least yet. I think I have the answer, and it's hidden in the words of Jesus. Let's flip over real quick to Mark 13, 32. These are the words of Jesus. He's talking about the day of the Lord, which means the day that God comes back when it's done, the battle of Armageddon. These are Jesus. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, and this is the part that's crazy, nor the Son only the Father. That's a big statement. That means that the day of the Lord, when God comes back, the angels have no idea. And it even says that Jesus has no idea when it's going to happen. He doesn't know the hour. So what a lot of theologians think, and I lean towards this, is that Satan also doesn't know when the end times are going to be. 
God's the one that decides. It's at the beginning of the tribulation, seven years. We're going to get into that more next week. But God is the one that decides when it's time for the Antichrist to show up, not Satan. And so I think that Satan has to always have an Antichrist ready so that when God decides this is when the tribulation is going to start, that he already has his person ready. And we're going to read in a little bit that at that moment, he will give his full authority to the Antichrist. So there's a possibility that the Antichrist is more of a spirit and more of a, a, an idea that one day will be embodied by a person. But that I believe that if we look back through history, there are a few candidates that could have been Antichrist-type candidates. And we're going to go through some of them. The first one that I think is in history that really resonates with people from a historical standpoint was in AD 37, and it was a Roman emperor named Caligula. Now, if you want to know more about Caligula and you like scary movies and haunted houses and, and all of those things, I don't. I'm not that brave. I know that's hard to imagine. I'm just not. But that's not funny. But, but they have this thing called Fox's, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it talks all about the first century church and the gruesome ways that they stood up for their faith and watched their spouses and their children die under persecution, and you're worried because somebody unfollowed you on Instagram. And so Caligula really brought a lot of persecution to the church during the Roman Empire. He took over at 25. The, the, the Senate would document that he would say this phrase all the time. I can do what I want to who I want when I want because I am God. The spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the anti-God. In fact, he would end up getting stabbed to death, him and his whole family. But before that, he brought such persecution on the church, sexual debauchery, ruled by fear and terror. But that's not what the main hallmark is that could potentially make him an Antichrist candidate. We're going to read a little bit later, but the main thing was he stepped into the temple. He resurrected a statue of himself and declared himself God. Then... A second character was 20 years later, Emperor Caesar Nero. And, and we went all through this to the point of nauseam at the uh, series we did a while ago called Peter and the Living Stones, called Nero and the Living Stones. You can be one of a couple dozen people to go back and watch it on YouTube if you want. Don't mean to brag. But, but Nero brought persecution on the church like they had never seen. Like, I mean, dip them in wax and light Christians as human candles to illuminate the gardens of his property while he had dinner parties. And so Nero, an antichrist-like spirit that was against God, declared himself God. I think if we, we move forward a little bit in history, there's certainly a couple other candidates. I think that we could all agree that Hitler would be an antichrist type of spirit. Mussolini. I've got one, one uncle who believes that the Antichrist is Barack Obama. I got another uncle that believes it's Donald Trump. I don't think I have anybody that believes it's Joe Biden. But, but, but pretty much, that's, that's not funny, but pretty much, pretty much whatever like political party you're against when that person's in power, like the temptation is like, they are the Antichrist, they are, you know, and it's like, guys. And so the point of all of this is not to make us scared but to make us prepared. And that's the whole point of these, these two, this two-part series is I want you to be prepared because you don't want to wait until the persecution comes to start figuring out your theology, what you believe, and what you're willing to die for. Don't do that in the middle of the storm. Do that now. And do your children a favor and start raising them in this, but it requires knowledge. But the reality is most of our eschatology, which is a study of end times, comes from small clips we hear from preachers on TikTok when we have access to the word of God because we see over and over again that none of these things should actually scare us. In fact, God has laid out ahead of time tons and tons of details so that we will not be scared, but that we will be prepared. You know what the most interesting one that I heard of people who could said this could be the Antichrist? These are things that are going to make you go, hmm, you'll see. I heard, and there's actually a whole Reddit message board on this, that the Antichrist is going to actually be the Internet. I told you, I heard it. it and, and it's the idea of that the Antichrist has influence, 
has power, can determine who has a voice and who doesn't have a voice, can determine what you think, what you feel, what you hear, what you see. And here's the most interesting part. The sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is W. So every time you go to a website, you put in W, 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 which in Hebrew is six, 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 things that make you go. Interesting stuff. Is the internet going to be the Antichrist? No, but it's interesting. The point is, of this whole thing is I want to give you information so that you know, so that you can see the signs, so that you can recognize what's real, what God says, and what is fake news. That was an impersonation. It's pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. So... Have we already missed the day of the Lord? Has it already happened? See, Kirk Cameron would probably tell you he was left behind. But <laughs> so, some of you don't even know who Kirk Cameron is because you don't know what good TV is. But, but has it already happened? And to you, you might think no, because you have the luxury of Wikipedia. But you can go find out what's fact, right? But, but, but you and I have access to information the ancient world could never even fathom. And so they faced this idea of misinformation all the time, fake news all the time, because they didn't know. So if I'm over here on this little island and over there on the other side of the world, something's happening, I wouldn't know about it for a long time. And so I think that we can see in Scripture when the end times happen, what's going to happen, and the timeline of it all. Now, I'm not going to get pulled into this argument of the vaccination because I'm not stupid enough to, but it's not a should you, should you not, is this real, is it not, forget all of that for a moment. But I did hear a lot of Christians say that the COVID vaccination is the mark of the beast and it is just biblical ignorance because it doesn't fit the timeline. This is why you and I have to be knowledgeable in Scripture ahead of time so that when it occurs, we know exactly what it is and we can be the voice of truth. So the church in Thessalonica, it's where we get First and Second Thessalonians, Paul's letter to those churches. In Second Thessalonians, Paul is going to write them a letter because he's going to correct some false teaching. See, what happened is these false teachers came in and they started telling everybody, you've already missed the day of the Lord. You're stuck here on this little island in Greece. But, but over there, it's already happened. God's already come back. So now you're just going to be lazy and wait for his millennial kingdom. So you've already missed it. And they believed it. And they started living what they heard rather than what God said. And Paul corrects it, and he lays out the timeline that all of this has to happen. So here we are, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, do not become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. If you underline that, the man of lawlessness is the Antichrist. So the day of the Lord isn't going to come until the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming to be God. Now you see why Caligula was a great, great example of a potential antichrist. Now here we are, verses 5 through 10, and I could have done a whole series just on this. So lean into this, go back this week and study it. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed, underline, at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless, lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus Christ will overthrow. This is my favorite part of the whole thing. Listen to this. Jesus will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroyed by the splendor of his coming. Mm. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. 
in all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Let's break this down for a moment. So first of all, it says right here that you know the one who is holding back the man of lawlessness until the proper time. You need to understand that this is God who is going to tell the Antichrist and Satan when it is time. It's not like God's just sitting there going, I don't know when Satan's going to do it. When's he going to attack? I don't know. I got to be ready. No, no. It is God who says, now is the time according to my will. And Satan is like a dog in the backyard who has the collar and the electric fence. And he may have a little bit of area that the owner decides that he can have. And at the press of the button, he reminds him who's in power. That's how this plays out. So Jesus will determine when it's the proper time, what makes it the proper time. The tribulation, when the tribulation occurs, that's how we know it will be the Antichrist. God decides it. The other thing I want you to hear is this. It says, verse 7, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. So let me tell you what I believe is happening today in our society right now. I believe that Satan is setting the table for the end times, so that when it happens, it happens rapidly. See, in Revelation, we sometimes use the word quickly, but it's not quickly, it's rapidly, meaning all this tension is building up so that when it happens, a lot happens in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. We're going to go through that next week. Why? Because my grandfather was a preacher, and he said, always leave them wanting more. But it's going to happen rapidly. And so what I think Satan is doing right now is he's metaphorically pouring gasoline all throughout culture, all throughout the world, so that when it's time, he takes a match out and spreads. And what is he spreading? The same thing that he did in the Garden of Eden is that man knows better than God, that the creation knows better than the creator. I am attracted to this, so this is what I want, and it's more important than what God has said. This is what I feel like I am, so this is more important than what God said. And you see it all throughout society today, is what man wants, what man desires, what man believes trumps what God says in his word. And all it's going to take is one person that's going to be the champion of the people to rise up, tell them what they want to hear, declare himself Messiah, and you can see right now that they will fall for it. Will your children fall for it? Will your grandchildren fall for it? Will you fall for it? Will you be one of the people that God says, depart from me, for I never knew you? Now's the time, church, to rally together. Now's the time to stand for what is right, to stand for the word of God. But you can't stand for something that you don't know. And my favorite part of that is it says that the Lord Jesus will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. And so I, I love this because you see all of this power and of the world and the authority of Satan is going to be placed on the Antichrist and Jesus is going to show up and with his breath it's destroyed. With just the radiance of Shekinah glory coming down with his believers and the saints for the remnant, it's going to destroy the Antichrist. It's not like Satan and God are just duking it out and the Lord's going to win just barely. It's his splendor destroys it. So now let's, let's shift. This is our halfway point. We're going to pivot. Time goes by when you're having a good time, doesn't it? And, and, and we're going to talk about revelation for a moment. For some of you, this may be review. For some of you, this may be brand new. But it's good to review this once in a while. And it's the book of Revelation. So we're going to be in Revelation 13. If you have time to flip your pages or if your Bible glows and illuminates your face to go ahead and get the drop-down menu. Or you can just stare at me blankly again. Uh, but, but we're going to be in Revelation 13, but we'll also have it up on the screen. And, and, but before we get to that, you need to understand what Revelation is. I started off with this. Revelation is given to the believers to be prepared, not to be scared, to be aware. And, 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 and so John, at this period of his life, he receives a revelation from the Lord. Around A.D. 90 to A.D. 95, somewhere around there, he's exiled by the Roman government on the island of Patmos. 
A couple of years ago, my wife and I went to the island of Patmos. I went down in the cave where John received the revelation. And I'm telling you right now, I could feel the Holy Spirit in that place, even to this day. So John is exiled. The island of Patmos, even today, is like hardly anybody lives there. And if they do, it's just for the cruise ships that come by. And, and there's not a whole lot growing there. It's a great place to exile somebody. Desolate, feels kind of hopeless. And, and, and John is exiled there late in his life. Now, now long gone are all of his friends, the disciples, Jesus. And at this point now, it's been decades, and people are starting to wonder if all that stuff Jesus said was real. Was it a myth? Was it just like a, was he just a prophet? And, and, and so John, God gives him this revelation and he sees what happened, what is happening and what is going to happen. And even during then, God shows him the throne room of God, the third heaven, when he's up there in the, th- the throne room of God and he sees what happened, what is happening and what's going to happen in the throne room of God. And he receives this revelation and he writes it all down. And you and I have access to this information even today. And it lays out exactly what's going to happen. Let's jump in. Before we we look, you have to know three people in Revelation. It's the unholy trinity. And you got to remember that Satan cannot create anything. So he creates the counterfeit of everything God made. God gives you truth. Satan creates some truth, mostly lie, counterfeit. And so you're going to see the unholy trinity. So God is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The unholy trinity. The first one is the dragon which represents Satan. When you see that in Revelation, the dragon refers to Satan. It's it's difficult to read Revelation without any kind of guidance or instruction because it can be tricky. So when you see the dragon, just know that's Satan. The second one you're going to see is the beast out of the sea, and that's referring to the Antichrist. And we're going to describe what all that means in just a few short minutes. And then the third one, which will save almost all of him for next week, is the false prophet. And that is the beast out of the earth. So you have the dragon, the beast out of the sea, the beast out of the earth, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Those are the three main characters of what we need to know. So let's find out what happens and where the Antichrist comes from. Revelation 13. The dragon, what is the dragon? Who's that? You guys are so smart. That's right. This isn't the remedial class, clearly. All right, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, underline the word sea, and I saw the beast coming out of the sea. It had 10 horns, seven heads with 10 crowns on its horn, and each one had a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave his, the beast his power and his throne and his authority. Satan has a decent amount of authority here on earth for now. And so what happens is, is that they describes all of these things and then Satan gives the beast his power and his authority. And I'm reading this going, this is weird, man. Horns, heads, lions, bears. This is the weirdest looking Pokemon I have ever seen. What does all of this mean? Well, let's break it down for a moment. So it says the dragon is going to see him out of the sea. So rarely in Scripture does the word sea actually mean physical sea. See it Galilee most of the time. But, but sea is a metaphor for the sea of humanity. So that means that the Antichrist will indeed be human. He's not spiritual. He's not an angel. He will be human. The pronouns that are used all throughout Revelation 13 and also the rest of the book of Revelation are all masculine pronouns. So ladies... You're not the Antichrist. Now, your husband could be. This is the sea of humanity of the Gentile nation, so it will also be a non-Jew. That's worth noticing. But the ten horns, the seven heads, and all of these animals, that, that, that feels weird on the surface. But again, as I told you, the word of God is not to be picked in little parts like you're at some buffet, but it's to be taken in its entirety. This is why I cannot stress enough, please, 
Take the time to make a priority reading the entire Word of God in your life. In January, we're starting another round of reading the Bible in a year. It's not too late to jump on board. Make it a priority. It's intended to be taken from Genesis to Revelation. And the secret of all of these weird animals is hidden in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. Now, if you are 15, it's not too early to start reading the Word of God. If you are 80, it's not too late to start reading the Word of God if you've never done it before. If you're 150, (laughs) it's not too late to start reading the Word of God or go to a Christian nightclub. That's going to make no sense to the podcast audience, but that's all right. I cannot implore that enough. The first time I ever felt the voice of God clearly was after I had finished reading the Bible in its entirety to, in a year. I was 35. This is the first time. I had never actually definitively heard the voice of God till I did. You want to know why? Because at that point I could recognize what the voice of God sounded like through the word of God. You want to hear from God? How much time do you read here studying what his voice sounds like? Daniel 7. This is a vision that Daniel receives. This is Daniel in the lion's den. When he's in Babylon, he receives a vision from the Lord, and he's saying it. And I want you to hear this. Keep in mind what we just read about the Antichrist. In the year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked, and before me were the four winds of heaven, churning up the great, what? See, four great beasts, each different from others, came up out of the what? The first was like a lion, and it had wings of an eagle. I watched it until its wings were torn off, and it lifted from the ground, so that on it stood its two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human was given to it. And before me was the second beast, which stood like a bear. It was raised up on its sides. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. And after that, I looked, and there before me was another beast that looked like a leopard. And on its back had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. And it was different from all the former beasts. It had... Ten horns. So what Daniel is describing in this vision, if you've ever studied the book of Daniel, is he is given a vision of what the next four empires are going to be. The Babylon is the lion. Medo-Persia is the bear. Greek is the leopard, followed by the Roman Empire. And so it's listing all of the different empires. Again, what's going to happen in this world should never be a secret to you and I. It is all revealed the word of God, and it was back then. But then what John is tying this to in the book of Revelation is that all of these things are also characteristics of the Antichrist because it's the same things in the reverse order. So what does that mean? It means that in a short amount of time, he is going to get what all four of those empires got, but he's going to do it in three and a half years. The expansion, the rule, the money, the authority, the influence, the terror. He's going to receive all of those of those empires together in just three and a half short years. Again, it's not to be scared, but it is to be prepared. So now let's find out how it happens. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they had also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? They're giving him glory. You ever been to a concert and seen how people act towards the people who are on stage? They are worshipping them. Who can be like them? And then they're afraid because they say, who could ever wage war against the beast? So even if we see something that we have a problem with, how are we ever going to win? But 
But look at verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound. One translation says, appeared. Because remember, this is a human. And Satan is the deceiver and the liar and the counterfeit. So what it says is going to happen is there's some sort of massive head wound here. Or at least it will appear as if it is a head wound. And then it will appear as if he has overcome that. Which then would lead people to say, this is the Messiah. He defeated death. There wasn't Jesus. This is the real defeated death. And do you want to know why I think that this is very plausible? When John was writing this, it was first century, and it would have had to seem impossible that something could happen and that the whole world could see it. Remember, we just talked about the church in Thessalonica. They didn't even know what was going on in another island. And John is writing this down as God is giving him this revelation. And he has to be thinking, like, how is this going to happen where the whole world is going to see it? But you and I now in the world of technology, if some dude gets shot, and appears to just rise back up without any problems, we're going to hear about it instantly. It's going to go viral. That dude's going to have a blue check mark next to his name before it finishes, finishes rendering. Like, we're going to hear about it. And what's going to happen? Who is like this guy? Everything he says and then his message is going to be what the world wants to hear, not what God says but what do you want to do? How do you feel? What do you feel like? Who are you attracted to? What do you want to do? And they're going to fall for it, and the crowds are going to raise up. Who is like the beast? Can you see it happening? Can you see it as possible? Can you see the gasoline already being poured on our culture that one match will light it all up? I want to end it this direction. Because next week we're going to talk about the mark of the beast, the false prophet, and the demise of the Antichrist. I bet you'll be back. You know, if I said, we're going to preach on the tabernacle, fasting, and tithing, you're going to be here? <laughs> I won't. No, no, I will. I will, because you pay me. But I want to end it with this because I don't want to end it with us being afraid of all these things the Antichrist is going to do. I want to remind you that the book of Revelation is to make us prepared, not to make us scared. And I want to remind you what it's going to look like when this is over. And I think it's going to paint a different picture for you. This is the way that we should end it. And I want you to turn to Revelation 19. Verse 11 this is John receiving the revelation of what the actual day of the Lord is going to look like when Jesus returns. And if this doesn't get you fired up, nothing will. Verse 11, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Those should be capitalized in your Bible. That should give you an indication of who we are talking about. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. This word here in the Greek is the highest level of crowns. Not the same crowns that the Antichrist is wearing, but the highest crown. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. How did John start chapter 1 of his gospel? He said, in the beginning was the, capitalized the same way this was. Verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses. Are there going to be animals in heaven? There's at least going to be horses. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean to represent pure. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword in which to strike down the nations. It's the word of God. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty and on his robe and his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings. And Lord of Lords, church, what you need to hear is that Jesus will be coming back for his people. But this time, 
It will not be in the humble beginnings of a cave in Bethlehem or raised in a town where they say what good could come out of Nazareth. This time it will be as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. I've saved the best for last. What did he ride into battle on? A white horse. Now you have to remember hermeneutics, author, audience, author's intent. To the audience, it would have been the backdrop of the Roman Empire. That's who it would have been to. What would happen at the end of the battles during the Roman Empire is once a battle was won, the emperor would then come onto the battlefield. And to be fair, if I was the emperor, I, w- I would do that as well. I'd wait till it was over. War will mess up my hair. And, and, but, but once the battle was over, then he would ride onto the battlefield to show we won. And he would ride in a white horse, which was culturally symbolic of victory. But here's the part I love, is that Jesus and his saints and the angels and the army of heaven ride into the battle on the white horse, declaring that the battle has already been won. Come on, somebody. Which means your battle, your situation, your struggle, your anxiety, your fear, your diagnosis, whatever situation you and your family are going through, if we put it in the hands of God, we have to believe he's going to ride into that situation in a white horse because the battle belongs to the Lord and the battle has already been won. But do you believe it when you encounter that situation? I bet you do now. Because you and I are sons and daughters of the Most High King. And when he says you are the head, not the tail, and no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and that he is the ancient of days, that he sees the beginning from the end, we need to start walking like we believe it, and we need to start talking like it's true, and we need to start reaching people like we're running out of time because we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood called to be into his light and out of darkness. And if that doesn't get you fired up, nothing will. Would you stand with me, church? I'm going to close this out in prayer. And then we're going to sing a reprise one last time before you go out. And when you leave, that's when church starts. Don't come in here and get all fired up and then walk out and do nothing with it. Be filled up by the Holy Spirit when we're here so that you can pour that out on the community that God's put you in. Your hallway at work, your neighborhood, your kids' sports teams, your hallways at school. Don't just be hearers of the word of God, but let's be doers.